Sometimes technology actually doesn't improve everything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've had a lot of great blue sky thoughts tonight and uh, today, and, and we're thrilled. But uh, one of the problems that both my great friend T Bone Burnett and I have is that the audio that the average student <laughs> listens to through tiny earbuds on their iPod is not real music. It's highly compressed crap. So <laughs> we're, we're going to try an effort with the help of some of the supporters of the lab, including Verizon, and hopefully maybe we can even rope Qualcomm into this, mm -hmm. to deliver a much better audio standard. So I want to welcome to the lecture my great friend, T. Bone Burnett. Thank you. So this isn't, you know, let's see, let me just see something. Can you all see the, the waveform in that blue picture there? You can? Because I couldn't see it from where I was. Okay, so <clears throat> this, is a, this is an actual graph of, th of a 16K tone, a 16,000 cycle tone run through Pro Tools. And uh, at three different at three different uh, frequencies, would that be the right word? So the top one is a, as an actual a CD frequency. It's 44.1 uh, kilohertz. You know, 44,100 kilohertz. The second one is what video games were released at for quite some time, which is uh, 48,000 uh, cycles. And the, the uh, third one is a high, high resolution, 24, 96, 96,000 cycles. The, uh, <clears throat> the, the CD one, the top one is a CD, is, is significantly better than an MP3, which is what most music is distributed at these days. But if you look at it, you can see the waveform. You can see how the, the way, you can't even call them waves, the spikes are going in different directions. The uh, energy is actually circling back on itself. The, uh, the you know there are all sorts of jagged different angles, <coughs> and it's it's it actually causes stress to listen to that program. The second one you can see the sampling rate isn't quite high enough to get the full waveform and it's cut off. The third is the DVD or the 2496 uh, format, which approximates a wave and it sounds close enough to. Uh, to, uh, to analog that it's, it's you know, respectable, I guess you could say. But what I'm going to do now, what it, I, in <clears throat> I work a lot in the movie business, and um, one of the things we found is one of, the, one of the great embarrassments for record companies is for the last decade, t television and films have been releasing their secondary products at a higher quality audio than the music business has. You know? which is insane, it's scandalous, really, that the, the record industry's been selling its music at a lower, uh, lower quality than uh, it comes for free on a video game, for instance. <clears throat> In fact, that was demonstrated when Metallica, a uh, year or so ago, put out an album that their fans uh, uh, rebelled against because it was also in a video game and it sounded much better on the video game. People were watching it from their PlayStations, you know, <laughs> or listening to it from their PlayStations. So in, in the movies, uh, because they've been 2496 for some time, we've, we always go back to the most original source and re-digitize re, uh, it. Because we found that a lot of the music supervisors will, uh, when they want to put a cue, a source cue into a, into a film, they'll go to iTunes and download a, an MP3 and then uh, in insert that into a 2496K uh, program. So you have everything else, sound effects, voices, everything else that's the score, everything that's happening is happening at a very high quality while this, the music cues, the, the songs and the performances are at this other unlistenable quality. And I'm gonna show you now just the difference. So I'm gonna use these, uh, these two slides, this blue one, is going to be the high def. The red one will be low def. Okay, and and we're going to play a song. I was working with my wife down there on the VIS Sisterhood, 
and there, we had some Jimmy Reed music in it. <clears throat> and we had bought a, it was about 2002, we had bought a CD and we had inserted it into the film and, and it, you know, it sounded bad. So we went back and we got the original masters that had been recorded by Bill Putnam, who's one of the great geniuses of audio technology. You all know, probably none of you have heard of Bill Putnam, but he's, he's you know, he and Tom Dowd are the two greatest audio engineers in history. And uh, he had recorded this Jimmy Reed song, which was quite a surprise to me, because when I was a kid, Jimmy Reed was a blues artist, and he was considered, you know, uh, sort of uh, downtown, you know. It wasn't, you know, you didn't think, you, would, you wouldn't think it, he would have been so beautifully recorded from hearing it on the radio or something. So at any rate, we're going to start with the uh, 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 transfer of the master tape we got back from his record company, VJ Records. I'm going to let, let I'm going to play about a verse so you, your ears can become accustomed to the sound, and then I'm going to switch to the low def sound that people are listening to it today. This was actually the the second one is a product that was released and sold. Okay. Dying up here, man. <laughs> Is this thing on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ask any questions while we're figuring this out? <laughs> yeah, this is just what I'm talking about. Right? really was the limitations of the technology. You know, the, 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 what happened was, first of all, record companies have, been, have not been run by very smart people for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, there was the, only the bandwidth available to send small files through, through the internet. So when they started sending files through the internet, they compressed them to, uh, to enable them to be distributed or to be shared, as they said, you know. But um, you know that's no that limitation is no longer really valid. So MP3 at this point is as dead a medium as the A track tape cartridge. You know, it's it's dead. It hasn't died yet. But there's no there's absolutely no need for it. And it by the way it causes stress. You know, it's there are there have been oh we're ready. Okay, I'll show you the stress in just a minute. Listen to the harmonica now.
that's my presentation. I hope you could hear the difference. So uh, I'm going to start from the end. Uh, Steve Canepa runs the media and entertainment practice at IBM. Uh, and Peter Marks is head of R&D at Qualcomm. Uh, Larry Ruff is the vice president of Levi Strauss. Sriram Viswanathan has just taken over a new job, which is to be the innovation guru at Intel. Link Hoeing is vice president in charge of public policy and especially internet policy at Verizon. And T-Bone, you know, and you know me. So um, I think what I want to do is, is start with uh, maybe Steve. Uh, IBM is a company that classically was making hardware and was in the proprietary software systems business and through the efforts of lots of people decided to completely remake itself to become an internet services company. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the process of how IBM went through that radical transition and how, you know, as we talked about this morning, when we say that culture eats strategy for lunch, how was the culture of IBM, which was the classic white shirt, button-up culture that we all remember from the 50s, changed? And near death can be very motivating. <laughs> It's actually a timely question because IBM, I don't know if you know this, but in just a couple months' time, celebrates its 100th anniversary this year. So it was mentioned at one of the panels earlier today that even in the top Fortune 50 or S&P you know, 50 companies, that the half-life is about five or six years now. So to think about a company that's been around 100 years, obviously it's had to change dramatically over that time frame. Um, when John asked me the question, it just seems to me that one of the things that makes uh, you know, we did have you know, talk about speed bumps in in, in the in, in this evolutionary process. We hit one in about the 1993 time frame when we had gotten too focused on what our heritage was around mainframe computing, and and, and the marketplace shifted with distributed computing and the introduction of the PC and all that, and the market kind of moved away from IBM. And I, I think we learned some really valuable lessons about what it takes to be very uh, fluid in, in today's marketplace. So, so that, was a, that was a good um, learning experience. I think what, um, if I think about what makes our company able to adapt, it, part of it is our R&D. We spend today about $6 billion a year on R&D inside IBM, and we year after year after year create more patents than any other company on the planet. So innovation is deep in our DNA as a company, what we want to do. Uh, the second thing I think is discipline. As a, as a business company, um, we're very disciplined. And then the, th the third thing I think is staying close to our marketplace. We're not as well known in the general public because we don't make consumer products like a Microsoft or an Intel uh, who's you know, very active in chips and getting consumer products, etc. So you don't, you don't hear our name quite as much, but in the business, the business space, obviously, we're a very big player. But we do have these grand challenges that we focus on. So things over the years like putting a man on the moon or um, creating the air traffic control system or creating barcodes as we know it today. You know, every, Even on our desk today, there's a version of a barcode sitting there that allow you to connect your phone to the, to the chat session. All that kind of technology started in IBM. I don't know if you remember when we played Kasparov in, uh, in chess about 10 years ago. That was uh, one of these uh, deep challenges we took. And just recently, a few weeks ago, did anyone catch uh, the Jeopardy Watson thing that happened? Yeah. I happened to have the pleasure of coming here and hosting that night at, on, on the campus. It was, uh, it was quite extraordinary. In that, as an ex using that as an example, because that ties into the first panel that we saw today, the core of that is all this information is being created in blogs and tweets on the web 
uh, professionally produced newspapers, magazines. It's all in human language. And so the ability to analyze that, to understand what it is, is a really grand challenge. And that's what Watson was about. And it was about not only understanding it, but figuring out how you could train a computer with different, uh, with specific ontologies and disciplines in order to get smarter as it went, to learn as it goes, to have scoring algorithms and, and all that. And all that was kind of behind the scenes of what happened, of course, just the raw power of processing. Every time a question was asked, um, Watson went through 200 million pages of information in less than two seconds and, and analyzed. So think about you know a million 200 page books sitting in your library and analyzing those million books in less than two seconds and looking for relationships between specific words on any page in any of those books and how that information might be used to inform you on how to answer a question. That's what was going on in those two seconds. So to me, um, one of the things that I, and John mentioned, I work in the media and entertainment space, so I'm every day working with companies all over the globe that are in the business of producing or distributing content in some form, and including search and social networking and traditional players. And so I have uh, the real pleasure of taking all that innovation and technology and then being close to the marketplace and understanding what's happening in the marketplace and, and trying to make those two things come together. And I think that's partly what makes um, you know, IBM an interesting company because it is part of what we do as a company is we look for real world business problems or real world challenges and then we try to figure out how we can go after those. Great, thanks. So Sriram, when you and I first met in 1997, which shows how long we've both been around in this space, uh, Andy Grove was still your CEO, and he famously said, only the paranoid survive. Um, was that a, a, a way to instill a, a certain kind of fear of uh, resting on your laurels at Intel, or what was the culture of Intel that, that made you constantly be willing to uh, have to spend billions of dollars to take big, big risks? So as, as my fellow IBMer uh, commented, I think near-death experiences are perhaps the best you know, learning tool or management you know, uh, strategy exercises that one can go through. And in the case of Andy Grove uh, and Gordon Moore, for those of you that know Moore's Law uh, is after Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel. Um, Intel had a very close near-death experience, not dissimilar to the one that IBM went through with the advent of the PC itself, in large part, you know, caused by Microsoft and Intel. Uh, but specifically, at the time when the Japanese were really, you know, kicking Intel's, you know, rear end in semiconductors, specifically in memory, Intel was the number one player in DRAM, which is one of the you know earliest memory technologies. And you know, you found that kind of memory in chips that go into your you know, Casio watches and, you know, all sorts of things, you know, you know, the automatic signal in your traffic lights and so on and so forth. And it's incredible to think about Intel as a company that was a leader in that and, and not to mention feel threatened by the efficiencies and the manufacturing prowess of the Japanese. And so Intel truly experienced near death as a company at that time. And Gordon and, and Andy, uh, you know, looked at each other you know, the, the folklore goes that uh, they asked each other, so what do we do? And, and they, you know, they you know, uh, thought about uh, you know, what they would do if the board of Intel had kicked them out and brought in new management. And how would the new management you know, change the company? And lo and behold, uh, they answered the question very simply by saying, okay, well, why don't we just walk out of the door, assume that we've been kicked out by the board, and we will come back in as the new management. Now let's look at it what we will do to the company. And there in itself was the birth of Intel as we know it today, which became a processor company, the CPU company versus memory, or, or you know, memory versus logic. So Intel bet on logic in a very big way. We continue to do that. And, and to put the specific point uh, on your question, paranoia comes from those sorts of experiences. And ironically, one could argue, if you look at what uh, all the technology that we see out around us today, whether it's the iPad or iPhone or you know all sorts of gadgets that we carry around ourselves, you can make the case that 
you know, there's yet another inflection point that, you know, we at Intel and, and perhaps many, you know, around the table should really feel concerned about because the rules of the game, you know, with all due respects to, you know, T-Bone here about technology not necessarily giving the better life of tomorrow, the rules of the game are going to be changed. And who knows what's going to be different. So that drives the paranoia. And, you know, you, uh, as, as someone once said, you know, Intel is very risk averse. And, you know, having been at Intel for almost 20 years, I can tell you that Intel is probably the one company that I know of that continues to take risks that are just astronomical and, and plain and simple nuts. Because every year you end up spending $10 billion, 10 to $11 billion every year. And you're building factories to make products that have not been designed for markets that have not been created, for demand that has not been generated. So just think about that for a minute. And you have to do this repeatedly every year in the hope that you can monetize that factory in less than three and a half to four years. That's an incredible amount of risk. So it's a, it's a well, it brings the fear as almost as a cultural element of what you are. So paranoia is a good thing. Okay, so you know, I, I didn't really think it was going to go this direction, but I'm kind of liking this near-death experience. And I want, to, I want to ask first Larry and then T-Bone, because they're both in businesses that had near-death experiences. And, and Larry, uh, I had some fun time with your president, Bob Hansen, and he described a period when Levi's really was getting killed in the market uh, by either low-cost providers or by very high cost jeans and and you had to get back to your roots of what you were as a company. And can you can you describe how maybe the role of social networks and other online things might have helped you uh, retouch base with your uh, authentic self? Sure, sure. So Levi's is a 150, actually almost 160 year old company. So we've been around a long time. Uh, established in Northern California as part of the gold rush and then gradually expanded around the world through uh, the 1900s and still expanding today to a business that has presence in over like 110 countries around the world. What started to happen though in the it was late 90s, early 2000s that led to the uh, near death that we've heard about so far and the question spoke to uh, was just a really significant change in the external landscape, partly driven by where people would um, buy their jeans, so there's some consumer behavior changes. Um, some parts of the world moving more, we call down channel to like the mass um, merchant channel, like Walmart, Target, and also um, competition on the higher end through a lot of new brands that came in that were you know premium, super premium players. And Levi's being kind of the biggest guy, and the guy in the middle is getting kind of squeezed from uh, both top and and bottom. And then the near death experience happened in the early 2000s, where our business uh, contracted to the point where we were under significant pressure um, financially as well as from our board. We're a privately owned uh, company, so the family's involved and they, uh, when they get unhappy, everyone knows. Um, so the, uh, we began a process of kind of the defining a map for the future, turnaround for the company that really looked focusing on the consumer in terms of the, what's the product experience we're delivering, what's the retail experience we're delivering, and what's the consumer engagement or the marketing approach uh, that we need to evolve to uh, because we thought we were stuck too much in the kind of old traditional uh, ways of brand building within the, uh, within the company on, on Levi's and Dockers and some of our other brands. So what we started to do, I'd say, and it's more like the past five years now, is, is a big shift to um, change the way we market. So a lot of it you heard out over the course of the day about being more authentic, transparent, engagement oriented. And so that meant a significant shift in terms of how we spend our marketing money, what our marketing priorities are. And we also talk about as a company, we want to be consumer obsessed, so big time external focus, a big time focus on curiosity, um, as well as product driven. So bringing product news to consumers kind of on a continuous basis. So for us within the marketing uh, mix, we started to think about how we shift what we do, where we invest, and that's led to the uh, increased uh, focus on uh, social media, social marketing that Megan talked a little bit about on the panel earlier this morning in terms of our relationship with 
Facebook, building a significant fan base of about four million uh, that we use for a variety of different reasons to sometimes it's very straightforward, deliver product news, retail news, marketing news, but also as vehicles for feedback, dialogue, engagement, and to build advocacy for the brand. And that's become more and more important for um, what we do both from a um, consumer engagement point of view as well as insights point of view and it's part of the fundamental turnaround strategy for the company. Great. So, T-Bum, uh, the music business has maybe fallen by half in the last five years, six years. Uh, obviously, uh, illegal downloading and all those other things are, are wiping it out in some ways, but obviously it's also, from your point of view, trying to reinvent itself. And can you talk a little bit about the upsides and the downsides of the near-death experience of, of the music business in the past five to ten years? I have to think about the upside. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, you know, I hear you hear a lot. There's a there's been a extreme dislocation. The uh, the record companies that were the uh, mediators between the audience and the artists have totally discredited, discredited themselves, and there's no one really mediating that except possibly the hive mind, and, you know. But, um, uh, you know, the, it, the, the people the, the people out there are saying, you know, there are a lot of people who say that copyright is inhibiting uh, innovation. But in my experience in the record business, the thing that's really inhibited innovation is, is uh, lack of investment. I mean, I don't know anything that in inhibits innovation more than zero investment, which is the re what the record business has had in the last five years. So, Link and Peter, you're both involved deeply in a new mobile ecosystem. And obviously, I showed a, a slide at the very beginning of the day and which says that mobile traffic, including video, will grow 40 times each year, and, and just extraordinary explosion in, in the amount of video flowing uh, over mobile networks and everything else. But on, on some level, there is a, an emerging mobile ecosystem that involves things like geolocation, um, other technologies, um, that potentially impinge on people's privacy in a word and way. You know, someone described to me, you know, that really Foursquare has turned into an app where you can, you know, find out that there's 10 great girls at this bar and you should all go to this bar and that's really what it's for. But um, Peter, you, you described to me a little, uh, the situation on the USC campus that was kind of interesting, uh, having to do with facial recognition that I, I'd like you to just describe and then we'll, we'll go from there. Okay. Maybe I'll do a quick introduction of Qualcomm. Okay. Um, so my name is Peter Marks. A couple of introductory comments. One is that I feel that, like the uh, young child sitting between a 100-year-old and a 150-year-old. Because <laughs> Qualcomm only uh, celebrated its 25th anniversary last year. <laughs> I think they look pretty good, by the way. <laughs> um, and the other thing I just want to say quickly before we launch into this is that my manager, my boss, would be very surprised to know that I ran uh, all of R&D. I'm the senior business person, Michelle. Um, I'm the senior uh, VP of business development and digital studio for corporate R&D at Qualcomm. And so Qualcomm, I think, you probably have all heard of and have no specific idea of what we do. Um, we're very much the enabler behind a lot of the mobile ecosystem. So we spend billions of dollars, I just have to throw that out, I'm going to throw out the word ontology too, um, into, into the mobile ecosystem, which is really to enable you to be able to communicate and access the internet and to do social networking and to essentially interpret the world as you go through your daily lives. And one of those things is that we're spending a lot of time doing augmented reality. So where you take your, your cell phone, your smartphone, and I would assume that most of the people in this room have one, 
Um, but you can take your smartphone and point it at something. And it a will cell phone or augmented reality? Well, the <laughs> cell phone. <laughs> so, uh, the, the smart telephone. Um, but you can point it at something, and it will interpret the world. You can point it at an advertisement, for example, for Levi's. And standing on that advertisement could be a model. And you could literally say, no, I want to try the clothes this way, or I want to try this color, or see this. Um, and what John was talking about, amongst well, other things, is that there are a lot of people working on facial recognition. Um, and the story that I think he's referring to is, is that I was walking around campus a little bit earlier with a friend and a colleague. And they said, um, wouldn't it be nice if you could just point your phone or just know everybody that you're seeing in front of you what their Facebook page looks like? And I think there's a benefit there. But I also think it's a, there's a profoundly scary part to that, which is, you know, we all have to balance our public and private lives, which I think is really part of the issue that John is speaking to. But that said, you know, these devices, if you think that the cell phone is going to be useful, I'm not sure yet, you think the internet thing is going to work out, people are going to use that, it's a very, very powerful uh, set of technologies for people to go and be able to do things that we've never been able to do before. So, so like I interviewed uh, Ivan Seidenberg about uh, a year ago, I guess, and uh, we were talking about the notion of behavioral targeting and advertising and how much data you know companies keep on people, and, and Ivan said, well, if we did what Google did, they'd throw us in jail. <laughs> now that may be Ivan being a little uh, outrageous, but obviously different companies operate under a different set of rules. And, and do you think, um, are there any kind of rules for privacy and some of these other issues that are going to have to be dealt with on a regulatory basis? Or are these things that the companies themselves are going to have to kind of figure out how we navigate this privacy uh, issue. So here we are in Southern California on a warm, sunny day, and we're talking about Washington policy stuff. <laughs> I'm sure you don't want to get into that too much, but, but that's my job, so I'll talk a little bit about that. My job actually is in Verizon, the interface between technology and our strategy and policy. So my job in part is to help interpret uh, for our policy folks what the technology trends mean and then what should we think about in terms of policy with respect to those technology and market trends? And I guess you could say we're a 160-year-old company if you look at the technology, because that goes all the way back to the patents for the telephone. But in terms of what kind of company we are, realistically, we're really a young company, because we've actually been through a major transformation ourselves. If you look back at what we were, 80% uh, of our revenues just 15 years ago was all voice telephone service. Today, uh, most of, a lot of our revenue, especially the growth part of the business, is in mobile. A lot of the company's focus has been transitioning more towards building out uh, mobile and the high-speed capacity networks. Um, and I guess there are really three things around what um, I've been hearing today about the risks in the business and in innovation and investment. Because I do agree with T-Bone that innovation doesn't mean anything unless you invest in it. You don't have innovations that mean something for the consumer unless it actually transforms their lives in some ways or affects it in a positive way. And that only happens if you're investing in something to make it possible to grow. So it takes a lot of resources to do that. In our case, uh, a lot of our investment is building essentially broadband networks. We build the fiber to the home network, and we are now at about 16 million houses we're past. And that's cost about $23 million to do that. And now we're building the fourth generation mobile network, which other companies in the industry are as well. And that's going to cost a lot of billions more. And if by 2013, most of the country should have access to network speeds of probably 5 to 12 megs down and 3 megs up, and that's conservative. So we really are changing a lot what people can do. And to get to T-Bone's point about MP3, MPEG-3, the group that did that standard, did MP3 in part because of scarcity. There just wasn't enough capacity in the networks to be able to do audio very easily. Now it's possible to do video and audio, but in those days it wasn't. So what did they do? They really took out a lot of information and the data that you were sending so you could get the information and still play a song. And you know, to most ears, because they weren't hearing the high fidelity that T-Bone was playing, it sounded great. So scarcity in our industry is really important. We've got to try to build networks that have more capacity so people can do more. 
And we're actually related very closely to all these companies because clearly what we're building is a platform that helps many of them actually build other products on that that actually help create innovation. So to me, one issue is scarcity and how can we encourage policies that actually encourage companies to build networks and build new devices and build innovation. Uh, it's a, a critical thing. We can talk about what those are. On the two other issues, though, that are front and center here that John mentioned, one is privacy, and T-Bone was talking about intellectual property. In both of those cases in Washington, there's a lot of attention on those issues right now, partly for the, issue, the reasons you heard, because people are doing more and more online. There's more and more concern that, in fact, uh, companies are actually doing things to track what people are doing, uh, and there's some good reasons for that, that in fact you can actually target ads better and, and you actually give people better information and a better web experience if you actually have information on what they are accessing, what kinds of things they like. But there's a, the downside of it for people is that that sounds kind of you know, scary, that these companies actually have that information and what are they doing with it. So there is a lot of attention on how do we develop privacy policies in the 21st century and with these new networks and with these new capabilities that allow people to have choice, because a key thing here is can you actually let companies actually acquire data that can be helpful in addressing consumer needs, but also give the consumers more transparency about what the companies are doing and gathering that data, and some choice of whether or not they want the data gathered, gathered in the first place. So my, my belief is, John, that you're probably going to have to have some legislation, there probably will be some legislation in, this play, in that space in terms of privacy. Uh, there's been some interesting reports that the Commerce Department and the White House have actually done on this, already trying to lay out a framework. But the interesting thing is the policy frameworks we have today are a lot different than what the policy frameworks were just 15 or 20 years ago. In those days, we spent a lot more time regulating, trying to establish what the rules were and set them out ahead of time. Now I think people are recognizing that technology changes so much we can't do that as much. So now we've got to do more around setting principles out, letting companies set up uh, policies that actually reflect those principles, having safe harbors so the companies certify they're meeting those principles, and then having somebody oversee it, like the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and in the intellectual property space, I think the same thing is true. You've got to do more to try to, as an industry, and we're part of the industry that transport this data, uh, new models that actually help protect privacy of intellectual property, but don't uh, get too regulatory so that people can't innovate. And that's really the balance that we've got to strike. Okay. Great. So I want to encourage people to come to the microphones, and, and in the meantime, while you're trying to think of some questions, I think one of the issues that I struggle with is how is it that the academy, you know, Hesstein talks about long fuse big bang projects, and that often inside a corporation, and I, I would say that Intel is probably a big exception to this, it's very hard for companies to make these investments to things that won't pay off for 10 years. And the question is, is there a role from our corporate friends that the academy can play because these issues of immediate reward are not something that we'd live with? I mean, we're not having to put out a quarterly report. If I may, yeah. yeah. So I think it's a very uh, poignant question because, as you referred in your introductory uh, comments, you and I met in you know in the mid '90s, yeah. uh, and Intel, you know, was you know if it's a chip company today. It was a hardcore chip co chip company in the mid '90s, and we invested in one of your companies. It was Entertainer. It was video on demand. This was you know this was uh, video over IP delivered to set top boxes. You know, way before you know, anyone even thought about Netflix, right? Um, so at that time, we invested in companies uh, in the adjacency of the business that Intel was in. So, you know, I, I'd like to make uh, a, a correction to your premise that in large companies, innovation doesn't necessarily have to happen within the company. It can happen in the ecosystem. As long as you have a mechanism to tap into that ecosystem, to turn that innovation that happens outside to your advantage, then you win. Uh, you know, for every uh, investment that we've done externally through Intel Capital, I'm sure there are probably you know a few that uh, we should not have done. I mean, it's a little known secret that you know Intel's first hundred million dollar value in our portfolio, believe it or not, was this little company that we helped fund, which is called Broadcom. Um, you know, it's great. You know, great result 
for the industry at large. Now it's questionable whether that was, you know, how did that help Intel directly? So, you know, it's not clear. So I think the challenges a lot of the big companies have, the corporates have, is to really figure out what is that, um, the influence point in the ecosystem if you applied the right pressure that it can actually turn to become an advantage for you and for your strategies. That is the fundamental challenge. It's not the amount of money you throw at it. It's not the amount of you know, corporate strategic uh, you know, jargon we throw around about innovation. It's about being able to identify what those points of influences are and being able to act on them at the time they have to be acted on. Great. Peter, did you have a thought? Yeah, I did. So I spent a lot of time inside of large corporations and in, in very small corporations. But I will say one thing is I wanted to go back to 1987 when I was working at Apple and I was one of the small group of four people who wrote QuickTime. And Apple was doing it because it was a marketing exercise. We, uh, we were enabling a little known company called CNN to uh, start to show things on a computer. This is before the web. And I remember standing in Atlanta at a, at a show, and one of the guys from Apple looked at this incredibly small video, if you remember it was a postage stamp size video, and he said, this is going to change Hollywood. And I come from a third generation family who spent a lot of time in Hollywood. My grandfather was hired by Louis B. Mayer in 1929. And um, I have been teaching film school here for the last nine years. Um, but I've been, I, I looked at him and I thought he was nuts. Um, just absolutely thought he was nuts. And of course what happened was is that it eventually did change Hollywood. In fact, uh, MPEG and all these other things to a great degree were influenced by the video work that was done by Microsoft and Intel and Apple and IBM and a lot of other people. And I think it was sort of a surprise. And my point was is that innovation doesn't always happen, I think to Shree's point, by, by design. It isn't necessarily driven by a PowerPoint that somebody came up with that said, we're going to innovate here and do this, although I see a lot of that. Um, and you know, there are surprise advances, and we've all been witness of it for many, many years. And I think the, the point is, is that with the web and the internet, as we now call it, you, know, you start to see innovation happen at an incredibly rapid rate. And so all of these large corporations spend a lot of time placing many, many bets to see where they can influence ecosystems. I think to Steve's point and to Shree's point and so on, ecosystems that may not even exist when they were beginning to think of it. You know, the, the joke around Qualcomm's corporate R&D group, and we spent a lot of money doing things, is that if it happened in Star Trek or Star Wars or Minority Report, somebody inside the company is working on it. First question. Thanks. Uh, I want to kind of tie together some of the discussions that we've had today about innovation and cloud and now scarcity. I was wondering if you guys could talk to uh, bandwidth caps that we're starting to see in the mobile space and in the home internet space with uh, Fios just instituting a bandwidth cap. Is there any worry from the people on the panel that as a technological scarcity like what we saw with MP3 compression is replaced by a for-profit scarcity of what we're seeing with bandwidth caps, Will that inhibit innovation and the ability to move things into the cloud? I think, Link, you, you ought to take that one, there, please. <laughs> well, on, on FIAS, there is no cap yet. Uh, yes, I think sir, I meant UVerse, not FIAS. Okay, UVerse, yeah. Uh, so I don't have to address that. <laughs> uh, well, I, actually, I will talk about FIAS for a second, because I think it actually does tie into your point. The reason we actually, and that is a big risk to do that. We knew that our telephone network, the copper network, was really outdated. And if we didn't take the risk and invest in it, we either were going to have a landline network that was going to be outdated or we're going to not be able to compete with it or uh, we we're just going to have to essentially uh, sell it off. And you got a lot of flack from Wall Street nope. for making that investment. We did. Um, but, and, and today it's, it's growing pretty well. We've got about four and a half million, I think, customers now using Files. Um, so far we don't have a cap on that uh, per se. On the wireless side, there, there are caps, uh, usage or bandwidth caps. Um, and they're related to uh, mainly to the devices right now because we, uh, and LTE in particular, which is the next generation 4G technology, we only right now have modems and we have one phone that just came out. So we're just beginning to establish the pricing for that. Um, 
the issue with, with uh, mobile phones is that despite the fact that we are building a really high capacity network, uh, you still have some scarcity issues that do crop up because spectrum is a shared resource. So to some extent, these networks have to be managed a lot more carefully in some ways than a landline files network would have to be. Because in a landline network, you've got essentially a connection to a home. It is shared a little bit because these technologies have some sharing, but not very much compared to a spectrum uh, system. So one of the reasons that uh, we are looking at these kinds of packages is it does actually make people decide what, how much usage they want to uh, take uh, advantage of and how much they are willing to pay. If you didn't do that, it would be much harder to manage those kinds of services because they are shared. Now, one of the ways to help solve that, uh, to help increase the amount of capacity that people can get, is to make sure we have more spectrum. And one of the problems, we're, and one of the big policy issues right now in Washington is that in the U.S., we've made a lot of progress in going to 4G actually faster than other countries. Most people's perspective is probably driven by a lot of they see in the media that the United States is behind. The truth is we're not. We're actually making a lot of progress on 4G. But those networks are going to increase people's use of the technology, and that means we're going to need more spectrum. So one of the big issues is how do we free more of it up and make sure it gets in the market, and it's a big policy challenge right now. Sure. Yeah, I, I think you hit it on the nail. I think your question is very, very profound, because if you sort of roll back the clock and look at points in time when there's been a sort of a choke point for innovation, you could make the argument that the, the advent of the personal computer was one of those times where that choke point was removed. There was a lot of innovation. Software became a big deal and so on, right? And then in the mid-90s, the internet and the browser and you know, Mosaic was another you know, choke point removal. It's sort of like, you know, it roto rooted innovation and it had unintended consequences. You know, you had the bubble. I believe the whole advent of iPhone and iPod and iPads and all of that is another choke point remover. But the fundamental challenge we've had in terms of BOD, you know, if you think about MIPS and BOD, MIPS have always been for free. Somebody else pays for it. Every, t every 18 months you get it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. But BOD has not bandwidth, has not kept up with that. So if I were to sort of, you know, with all due respects to my colleague here, you know, if I were to take a 20,000 foot view on what is the fundamental inhibitor to, to innovation, it is the availability of bandwidth. And the problem is not in wired, because you can always get better FIOs, better UVerse, all of that. Wait till the deluge of mobile apps, data-rich apps, choke the next generation 4G network, because there simply ain't enough spectrum. FCC claims that there's at least another 500 to 1,000 megahertz of spectrum needed just to keep up with the rate of growth of demand in mobile as it stands today. So I don't think you know, any one of us can confidently say how the bandwidth, uh, you know, how that constraint is going to get removed. But I believe that is the fundamental inhibitor to innovation. If I could jump up. Yeah, Steve, go ahead, and then we'll take your question. Well, I was just going to say, because I think this is a, a, a great point. Um, and I'll, let me try and weave a couple themes together that we've been talking about with a couple stories. Um, I was with the CEO of one of the major movie studios a couple years ago having a discussion about this transformation that the industry is going under. And if you think about um, the world as we know it today, and you compare that to just a few years ago, it's very different. The amount of content that you produce and the ways you can consume that content now. And he, he said in a sentence what something to me that stuck with me and I think was quite profound and you just kind of raised the point, which was the, at its core, what's happening is we're moving from a world of scarce distribution to one of ubiquitous distribution. All of the business models, and John has lived these, and T-Bone's lived these, in the industry around content and information have always been predicated on the notion that there was scarce distribution, whether that was physical product, a magazine, a newspaper, or a, an album, or if that was windows that are used to release a movie into theatrical and then uh, onto DVD and then in, you know, to, to eventually to your home, etc. You could manage the distribution of information and content in such a way that you could squeeze out profit <laughs> out of the life cycle of that. And if you think about the music industry and what happened, in the last 10 years, the music labels, the five major music labels, uh, essentially have seen $100 billion disappear from what otherwise would have been their, their revenue streams. Now that money didn't just evaporate. You know, A lot of that moved up to Northern California into Apple's balance sheet, right? And then moved into 
firms that created home installation uh, uh, services that could come set up your home network so you could store your music digitally and it moved into a lot of uh, consumer electronics firms that make devices that store music, etc. And the consumption of music changed dramatically. But there was this incredible shift that happened in, in, in the value chain. And, and so to this discussion we just had now, scarce, it was all, it's almost the inverse of that, right? So now we're talking about scarcity has moved from the content being available to the network technology that allows you to access it. And, and so just like value shifted in the value chain for the music industry from the labels to other firms that could make money out of the consumption of music, but they weren't necessarily the ones producing it. Um, we're seeing shifts now where uh, where that scarcity challenge is changing or having an impact on the way we're, we're going to go forward and, and consume content. Okay, uh, Sasha? Hi, so <clears throat> so uh, Eric Van Hippel at MIT, who studies uh, user innovation, uh, has put out a sort of series of reports that are pretty interesting where he's looking at uh, user innovation in the EU. And it sort of basically argues that if you add up all of the innovation that users do in actually modifying, uh, modifying hardware devices, and this isn't just electronics, this is across sort of all different technologies, but it says that actually adds up to a far greater amount of money than the combined research budgets of all of the, the, uh, the top firms, and that's true across sort of each sector that you look at. And so I guess what I was you know, kind of wondering, following the question of how do you uh, work with a broader ecology of innovation and then bring that into the firm and also following up on this question of you know moving away from from a, a scarcity model um, you know traditionally the response has been to create artificial scarcity through copyrights and through patents and and that's been been the model if tomorrow uh, the regulatory environment shifted and law shifted and we that if there were no intellectual property tomorrow what would your business model be to capture user innovation and continue profitability within your firm, if that was the, the legal environment. So that's right. That's Peter, the Peter why, don't you, why don't you start? So why, don't we, why don't we take a look at scarcity? So we've been talking about scarcity of distribution. You know, It used to be that movies were distributed to theaters, and then to hotels and airlines, and then pay-per-view, and all that sort of stuff, and at each point, there was a distribution scarcity, and now the scarcity is really changing, where you can get lots of content available at any time that you want, everywhere. And the scarcity has really changed. The scarcity is now uh, in performances, and in really good content. So the, the music industry is no longer so reliant upon recorded music, but on performed music, you know, music, con you know, concerts, and things like that or really good content. There's only so many people in the world who make really, really good content. Um, but now if we take a look at your other, your other side of the question, which is how do you take you know, the group think, the world's, the world's innovation, and incorporate it? Um, you know, Qualcomm is a, also an intellectual property company. Our intellectual property are patents. Um, in fact, Qualcomm has no factories. We're the world's largest fabulous that's what they call it, a semiconductor company, because all we really do is that we design and build technology that other people manufacture. And our business model is to stay ahead on innovation, coming up with new things, such as, such as the telephone that's now available on Verizon. I think our chip is on it. Um, and, and really trying to keep ahead of the curve, or at least with consumers, as they demand new things, as they really, as consumer behavior is changing, all of our companies are trying to, to stay with them and to offer new services and products and technologies that enable consumers to go where they consciously or unconsciously are going. Okay, so uh, is there any under, one more question or not? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I had a question about the uh, MP3 and the um, MP3 moving away from the industry standard. Um, when do you think that will happen, and how do you think um, that's going to change the uh, music industry? You know, I don't know if the music industry, I, I don't even know that, that there is a music industry anymore. You know, I, you know, I gotta say, I, 
I'm not concerned about the music industry. I don't care about the music industry or any of these other monopolies, you know, that with, withhold uh, innovation from, you know, from the group thing. I just care about, I make music, I care about how good it sounds when people listen to it, you know. I don't want to, sp I, you know, why buy a $200,000 violin and have it played back through a speaker, essentially, but as, as if, if you open a Hallmark greeting card. You know, so so for me that I mean, because that's what digital sound is. Make no mistake, digital sound is in Hallmark greeting cards. That's what you're listening to. You know, so I mean, really, I, I don't. The way it's going to happen is the bandwidth is going to increase. People, there'll still be a black market in MP3s. You know, piracy has always opened up new markets. The, a new market will emerge. That will be served by a, a you know a higher quality you know it'll it'll that stuff will sort itself out. I, I only care like I I care about the the reason I care about quality is because I care about the audience you know. Yeah, I would just say that our hope is that at the lab we can coalesce the industry with T Bone's help and with the lab's help and some of the companies' help around a higher standard. And if the industry coalesces and said, we want that higher standard and it's going to be a streaming audio standard from the cloud, it will happen. It may take a while, but we hope it will happen. And, and that, to my, uh, and, and since we are past our finish point, I think that's the kind of perfect way to end the day in saying, look, if we can all work together, companies, researchers, academics, and everything, we can make some big changes. And I thank you all for coming.